inspiring. Um, my next uh, presenter we want to bring up is Laurel Schwulst. Uh, Laurel is a independent artist and also a critic at Yale University. Welcome, Laurel. Fantastic. And I'm going to try to. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm just going to start the timer. So. Um, first, I uh, just want to thank uh, Brendan for inviting me and um, for organizing this. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Laurel. Uh, I am currently an independent designer and artist and writer. Um, in the spring, I teach a class at Yale called um, Interactive Design in the Internet um, within the art school. Um, and before this, um, I was the creative director of an online publication, the Creative Independent. Uh, uh, published by Kickstarter. Um, and then before that, I worked with Link by Air, a New York based design studio that mostly specializes in um, websites for art institutions and individuals. Um, yeah. And um, you probably noticed this is like a spiral. <laughs> um, I just want to open with a quote from this poet, um, Ocean Vuong. Um, he, he had an interview published in The Creative Independent. Um, he says, the Italian philosopher Vico had this theory that time moves more in a spiral than it does in a line. He believes that that's why we, we repeat ourselves, including our tragedies, and that if we are more faithful to this moment, we can move away from the epicenter through distance and time, but we have to confront it every time. So every time we remember, we create new neurons, which is why memory is so unreliable. I thought, well, if the Greek word for poet is creator, then to remember is to create, and therefore to remember is to be a poet. I thought that was so neat. Everyone's a poet as long as they remember. Um, so yeah, so in my work, I think a lot about language and poetry and how they um, intersect with the web. And then, especially in this past year, I've been thinking about the state of the internet and the World Wide Web, um, which turned 29 this year. Um, so uh, a basic metaphor for the internet and the web sometimes is a cloud. Um, this idea that maybe like instead of on your hard drive, everything you need is like up there in this like mysterious ethereal cloud. But I think by now in 2018, we all like see the problems with this metaphor. Um, and here it's like shown further. These are old patent drawings of the internet. Um, clearly, we don't really know what it is. Besides a cloud, it's also like a mysterious blob, a brain, a web, um, an explosion shape. Um, it's like this big thing that's like kind of hard to understand um, and pin down. Um, so like anyone today, um, I've been thinking a lot about information overload. Um, and how to survive modern life, um, yeah, like Anil said, uh, a sustainable emotional life um, today with the internet. Um, and I think it, this is about this um, never ending stream of information. Uh, this is a quote um, by uh, Luis Rossetto, who the co founder and publisher of Wired magazine. Um, and in, in this introduction that he wrote, this, this quote is from 1993, so like 25 years ago which is incredible. Um, he also says this, um, there are a lot of magazines about technology. Wired is not one of them. Wired is about the most powerful people on the planet today, the digital generation. Um, and so, like I was saying, the Creative Independent, the creativeindependent.com is a website um, that I was creative director of. Um, and similar to Wired, it's based around people. Um, this, in fact, is the people page. Um, and there are over 400 people here. Um, the website was, uh, it went live in September 2016, and it was it's publishing about once every weekday. Um, and what unites all these people is that they're all working artists who have been interviewed by the Creative Independent um, about their process of creation. Um, and one thing I like about this is that uh, we've like interviewed really famous people like 
uh, pop star Bjork or like writer Hil Hilton Alls. Um, but we've also like interviewed less well-known creative people and they're just all kind of like on this page um, side by side, um, like a good uh, variety. Um, this is the Creative Independence homepage as of yesterday. Um, you'll see that it calls itself a growing resource of emotional and practical guidance for creative people. Um, and here on the homepage, uh, the most recent or relevant posts um, exist on this animated snail background. Um, and when you scroll to the bottom, um, you can see the snails uh, by themselves, but you can also see that uh, the Creative Independent is ad-free and published by Kickstarter. If you go to the About page, um, you can read more about it, um, including like the spiral. Um, and you can see I, I was the creative director and I'm listed as an alumni because I just, I worked there for one year. Um, but first I want to step back <laughs> to provide some background. Um, so this is me in 1999 um, in front of uh, my family's Dell computer, or maybe it was Gateway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, this was like the first picture I sent to like a sort of stranger, my email pen pal in California who also liked horses. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but growing up, I loved horses, art, and computers. Um, and I used the internet to connect with a small community of people online who happened to paint model horses. Um, I was on like a horseland.com, which is like a spinoff of Neopets, just for horses. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, this was like... You know, um, yeah, like Anil was saying, like, uh, like at this moment, I knew this was like very special and it was kind of like a golden age for me online. Um, and so today I'm still working with computers and art. Um, I also think a lot about animals. I mostly design websites, create visual identities and write. Um, but a lot has changed since then. Um, like instead of going online like once or twice a day and like blocking my family's phone line um we have it whenever we want um and i teach like i was saying interactive design at yale and um this is from a tr transcript of conversations we had in the fall leading up to the class um that i organized with dan michelson and ahem Grawi. um and in the conversation we talked about finding moments of punctuation um as, pra as important for any creative practice, but especially one that's mediated through technology. Um, because, you know, as a creative person, you're not gonna be like at the end of your life, like, okay, I'm done, like, let's take a picture now. Um, you have to like be punctuating at different moments um, to create this meaning. Um, yeah, I was extremely uh, lucky and honored to um, be brought onto the project of the Creative Independent when it wasn't even a website yet or didn't have a visual form. Um, so my job was to do that um, through visuals and a website. Um, and so Brandon Stosi and Equal Rachel um, were the people I first talked to. Um, Brandon's the editor in chief. Um, what I really liked is that they came to me with a few like pretty um, like they had enough uh, starting ideas with enough openness that led to some interesting dialogue. They thought they wanted the site to publish one interview with an artist per weekday. Um, they wanted the interviews to focus on the process of that artist um, instead of like the output. Um, and then another thing that was really interesting is that the site would just start with only two pieces of content on um, the first interview and like an opening letter. And then every weekday it would grow by one. Um, and then one other thing is that the site had the name of the Creative Independent, um, which I couldn't change. Um, <laughs> and so I started um, like from square one, just thinking about a few general themes. Um, the first was calendars of all types. Um, I started asking questions like, what's the website version uh, of an advent calendar? Or how can our website be on a schedule? Um, did our site have some like ritual component? Um, you know, just that it would be publishing every weekday. Um, and I was, I noticed that, um, yeah, a lot, you know, there are circular calendars too from the past, and that kind of led me to um, spirals. Um, and what I like about spirals um, is that they're a path, and, a, you know, the focus of the creative independent is on the process of the artist. You know, art is not a thing. 
it's like away. Um, that's a quote by Albert Hubbard. Um, and I also was reading this like kind of a cult classic, uh, or, uh, not, like, uh, not cult classic, um, like maybe a little bit like, uh, I'm not sure the word for it, but from the 90s, like a self-help help book by Julia Cameron called The Artist's Way. Um, and she says, um, as an artist, you will circle through some of the same issues over and over each time at a different level. There is no such thing as being done with an artistic life. Frustrations and rewards exist at all levels on the path. Our aim here is to find the trail, establish our footing, and begin the climb. Um, and then one other theme I was thinking about was the interconnectedness of all things. Um, I guess because I was given the title, the creative independent, which to be honest, I was kind of like a little suspicious of because I feel like those words creative and independent are really overused. Um, it just made me ask things like, well, what does it mean to be both creative and independent together? And then does being independent mean that you're no longer dependent? Um, I think the answer I came to was that um, Kickstarter is all about, or like Kickstarter, the company that founded this project is all about giving people the resources or support so that they can be independent. Um, and usually there's a rich network of people behind the most interesting independent individuals. And so it involves a lot of privilege. Um, yeah, and then um, one thing, um, this is a quote from Paul Ford, um, who was talking about the early days of the internet and maybe how like websites could be more like gardens. And I thought one thing that was really interesting about my time at the Creative Independent is that um, that differed from my past as a designer at Link by Air, where we would design, you know, one website after another and then like, you know, teach people how to use it and then like move on to the next one. I was here for a whole year and I was like maintaining it, you know, every day it would grow by one. And so sometimes that meant I just sh like shift little things. Um, so it was more like gardening than building. Um, um, yeah, and, and maybe one other thing to say about that, um, since our site was growing every day, we wanted it to be more like a garden than a, a completely built house because we wanted to leave room for some change through like what we understood over time. Um, so it, the design led for some like uh, uncertainty and flexibility. Um, and so the final logo ended up being a spiral. The pixelation refers to this like, you know, syncopation of everyday, everydayness or a punctuation. Um, and then maybe you could imagine this logo growing over time, like uh, just like a tree, you know, has uh, rings each year. And then there are a few other things about Spiral that's cool. Um, there's this snail that could be a potential mascot. And there are three things about snails that I like. One, <laughs> they have slime. Um, <laughs> and slime is like this thing that literally helps them move. But it's also this like beautiful map of where the snail has been. And so we use this metaphor to say, like, this is our goal as interviewers. We're trying to, like, illuminate the slime of artists, um, which they often conceal because they just want you to look at the final word. Um, and then slowness is another um, great thing about snails. Um, we didn't want, really want to worry about how our site was, like, keeping up with other sites. We were also privileged not to um, need ads. So we were just like, we'll just go at our own speed um, and focus on this everydayness. Um, we were like on our own schedule. Um, and then finally, the shell um, is also super um, interesting. Um, we became fond of this poet, Francis Ponge, um, who uh, wrote a poem about a snail. Um, he says that snails are like artists um, and that the snail shell is part of its essence. But at the same time, it's a work of art monument um, and it lasts longer than they do so snails and artists make masterpieces out of their lives um, works of their own perfection um, they secrete form uh, nothing outside themselves their necessity or their needs is their work nothing out is out of proportion with their physical being um, last year i read brian eno's um a year with swollen appendices his uh diary from 1995 um, and I thought it was interesting, he thinks that the word interactive is the wrong word to use. Maybe a more apt word is the word unfinished. Um, 
And there was a cross there because he wanted to put it on his gravestone. <laughs> um, and so for a while at the bottom of the Creative Independent website, we had this note that basically says, um, hello, you've reached the end of this page. If you have been here before, you may notice things are shifting. We're working on our website. Um, in fact, we may be working at this very moment, just as you are reading these very words. Things of value take time to grow, and their living evolution can be an integral part of their beauty. When is something finished, anyway? Um, and, you know, this, like, harkens back in some ways to the days of the old web when people would have, like, under construction signs um, all over their site, and they were, like, cool with it. <laughs> um, and so we wanted to make it, like, a you know, a loud, pliable fact that we're interviewing artists about their process, but we're also, like, on a meta level being, like, transparent about our own. Um, and just a few details of the website I want to show. Um, this is um, an individual page. Um, an editor makes highlights of the things they thought were the most important, important but you can turn them off. Whoa. <laughs> Um, we created a library page that um, was a mess cam feed of a stack of books. Um, and we wanted to make it like an intentional effect that it's not a big library, it's small. Um, and then back to the time thing, we started a series called uh, Weekend Events. And be because we were publishing every weekday, we thought maybe the site should do something special on the weekend. So we ran. Um, and commissioned web-based artworks. Um, this is a piece by Damon Zaccone that um, sources from, um, I think it's questions from Quora about the future, and um, he's the calendar is running. Um, this is a piece by Michelle Lynn. Um, it's a, a bird clock. I think if you look carefully, you can see the second hand moving. Um, so you could like view more information or just continue on to our main site. Um, this was a piece by Elliot Radner called The Creative Blur, and it just blurs the site. Um, yeah, CSS. Uh, Blur filter. <laughs> um, and I think all these details um, related to this quote um, by J.R. Carpenter from her essay on a handmade web. Um, she says, in today's highly commercialized web of multinational corporations, proprietary, proprietary applications, read-only devices, search algorithms, content management systems, WYSIWYG editors, and digital publishers, it becomes an increasingly radical act to hand code and self-publish experimental web art and writing projects. Um, oh, sorry, and then one other thing. Um, we made um, a Chrome extension that when you open a new tab, um, it shows you uh, one of the highlights from our article. Um, but I wanted to say, um, yeah, we had a lot of hand done things on our site, but we couldn't completely hand code it because it was being edited by like a handful of um, different editors. So we opted for, we use Jekyll um, and we use Siteleaf on a CMS to connect to Jekyll so non-tech people could interact with it. Um, and Jekyll is mostly text-based, which I think made sense for our content. It's also like pretty lightweight. I'm not sure how they're doing now because it's been like, you know, they have like so much content and they might have to move soon. But um, like of the CMSs, I would say like this is like a pretty good fit for us and like closer to handmade than like something more intense. Um, and then uh, I think I'm showing you this. This is the editing interface. Um, this is like the first uh, example article I made to show people how to make an article. It says a real snail on editing this website. And so this is like a page um, no one should be able to see but the editors. Um, and actually, like when I first introduced the idea of the spiral and the snail, people were like not really into the snail. Um, and so so I, I thought it would be fun just to like, you know, you know, placeholder content doesn't really matter. Just put it here. Um, 
And so, yeah, I just created the name Real Snail. Um, yeah, and so over time, another part of the site that was really cool is these email newsletters um, that we started sending out. We had we have two, um, a daily one and a weekly digest. And you can see the weekly digest is experimental. Um, but yeah, each weekly digest, we would kind of try something new. And at first we were, you know, writing a little letter and signing it from one of one of us, like the, the staff at the Creative Independent. But then over time, that kind of felt awkward, and more and more, we started signing it as a uh, real snail uh, mascot. Um, and so it was kind of neat to see the the mascot be adopted over time, um, not because I forced it, but because, you know, uh, <laughs> it just like made sense. Um, and this was actually a piece that was published ye yesterday. Um, it's an audio piece, so I'm just going to play it. Um, I didn't create this at all. This is um, the great work of Hannah Speed Elliott, who's an associate editor there now. Hello, welcome to the second episode of TCI Transmissions, an experimental sounds cape of things that sound nice and might help you make other things. This episode is part of our Rhizome 7 on 7 series. We asked Rhizome series participants one question. How would you describe your website? Yalda Mausovinia is a designer and co-founder of Space Cooperative, an organization that's currently working to create a decentralized space agency. Wait, okay, I just want to get this right. So I'm just describing a website and what I like or don't like about it? <laughs> okay. Pat Trockortright is a creator and distributor of digital files, whether they be videos, GIFs, or JPEGs using consumer or corporate software and platforms. <laughs> it the, my website is like rotting. It's just like in absolute decay. Francis Tseng is a designer and software engineer working in simulation, machine learning, and games. Um, so my website is broken down into four sections. Sean Razpit is an artist and co-founder of Non-Food, a company that makes algae-based meal bars. Let's see, my, so I have two websites, I guess, and my personal one is just really just hasn't been updated in a long time, so, uh, <laughs> so that, that I should mention. Tabita Rizer is a French video artist, health tech politics practitioner, and committee slash kundalini yoga teacher based in Johannesburg. www.tabitarizer.com Okay, I don't even know how to describe this. <laughs> okay, I'll try again. Some try to describe in detail the visuals of their site or the site they dream of having. Ideally, what it would look like is it's like the solar system, the planets are moving around, um, and then you can start to like zoom in on the planet. You can choose like Earth, and then from there, different like projects will branch out. Um, so, so yeah, I think a really interesting thing about this pro project was that I was there for one year and then I left and it's been about another year since then. Um, and I, I feel really lucky that like, I kind of feel like a proud parent in some ways, but it's, I mean, um, of course it's, it's many factors. It's, it's um, the people who are working on the site are really great. Um, Brandon Stosi, people, Rachel, Hannah Street, Elliot, uh, Willow owner and uh, Elliot Radner and they've been doing an amazing job but I also have to say I feel like me coming up with this stay on the spiral definitely like set a metaphor in motion that they were able to like latch latch on to so I've been thinking a lot about metaphors I've been reading this book called Metaphors We Live By by um, George Laskoff and Mark Johnson um, and they say metaphor unites reason and imagination um, in other words metaphor is an imaginative rationality um, I'm just going to read a little bit from it. Um, they say, We continually find it important to realize that the way we have been brought up to, to perceive the world is the, not the only way, and that it is possible to see beyond the truths of our culture. Um, but metaphors are not merely things to be seen beyond. In fact, one can only see beyond them only by using other metaphors. 
It is as though the ability to comprehend experience through metaphor were a sense, like seeing or touching or hearing, with metaphors providing the only ways to perceive and experience much of the world. Metaphor is as much a part of our functioning as our sense of touch and as precious. Successful functioning in our daily lives seems to require a constant shifting of metaphor. The use of many metaphors that are inconsistent with one another seems necessary for us if we are able to comprehend the details of our daily existence. Um, and so one other metaphor we were using for TCI was we imagined the website as a house next to a river. Um, and the interviews were like this flowing river. You know, they're all like on a daily basis. Um, and then we thought like the house was kind of like a laboratory where we're synthesizing the knowledge. And um, depending on, you know, the knowledge, like knowledge was the architect of our house. Sometimes like there'd be a new door or like a new window where a painting was. Um, and so that was like another helpful metaphor for us to think about our site. Um, and then um, you may have been noticing by now that I've been using sparrows um, to talk about the future of the web. Uh, this is a quote uh, from Tim Berners-Lee um, from his letter on the web's birthday back in March um, when it turned 29. Um, he says that the web is currently under a state of threat um, and that it needs to be more individual voices debating on the web's future. Um, and so even though it doesn't have as catchy a name as, of, as a cloud, I think an appropriate replacement for the cloud metaphor could be a flock of birds or, you know, a mesh of individuals or a sea of punctuation. Um, the singular, mysterious, like ethereal cloud metaphor, I think, um, like, abusicates our responsibility as individuals towards building a better web. Um, because really the web and the, is uh, just a lot of connected computers. Um, and then here's just one more bird quote um, from Mr. Rogers. <laughs> um, and this, this might sound like kind of cheesy, but I want to put this out there to you all. I've been starting to notice sparrows more, um, just like in the world. It's funny because they move really quickly, and so it's hard to focus on them, but they're actually the most widely distributed bird species on the planet. Um, and so when I look at a sparrow, I've been trying to do this thing where I um, think of each sparrow as an individual. I think oftentimes when we look at species that are not our own, we think of them as a group, but really like some are like more outgoing than others. Some are like happier or sadder. Um, and I think like meditating on the individualness of something as like small and ubiquitous as a sparrow could help us think about the individually, individuality and the responsibility we have uh, in the web. Um, yeah, that's all. <laughs>